um, the live stream is now starting. And so um, I would like to welcome everybody. I'm Susan Connor, and I'm the Assistant Director at the Swampscott Library. Um, we are delighted to have everybody here tonight. This is a real first for us. We are having a live showing simultaneously on Zoom, on YouTube, and on cable TV all at once. So we're trying to reach out and reach different audiences. Um, but I would like to um, I would like to introduce the filmmaker, tonight's filmmaker, <laughs> Swampscott Library's own Marie Epstein. She's a library staff member. And as a project over the summer and into the fall, she put together Coronacation. Um, Smile, Marie. <laughs> there we are. That's, um, see, we get, we get information from all over the place. Um, so, so we're um, I'm delighted to introduce Marie Epstein. Thank you, Susan. That was very nice. Um, I still have an echo. I'll just shut this off. Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't know why we have an echo. But um, so Alice assigned us all, since we were not working at the library for the first six months of the COVID shutdown, um, to do some sort of a project. And I just wanted to do that. And so I started with Nahant, which was good because Nahant's a lot smaller and a lot easier to handle. And um, I went all over Nahant and took pictures. And then I did a lot of research at the Swanscott Library and a lot of research online. And I put together this one on Swanscott as well as one on Nahant. The Nahant one's a lot shorter. But I found a lot of fascinating things about our local town that I didn't know. And I'm sure some of the history buffs might know a lot more or a lot of different angles on uh, some of the things. But it was incredibly fascinating, every aspect, from the old homes to the indigenous peoples to the um, houses that uh, were for a while. This was the first resort community. So anyways, I, I took most of the pictures that are current, but then I got a lot of them online or through books, the older pictures. And one of the greatest sources is old postcards. So I hope you enjoy it. And afterwards, I can answer some questions. And if I can't give you the facts now, perhaps I can post it on the website if there's answers that I can't come up with from my memory. So thank you for coming and I hope you enjoy our presentation. So we'll, we'll come back to Marie when the, when the show is over. And uh, for now, we'll ask everybody to mute yourselves while, um, while we're doing the presentation. So thank you. Um, there. Um, okay. Welcome to Swampscott, Massachusetts, first settled in 1629 and incorporated in 1852. Approximately three square miles and over 15,000 residents make up this seaside town. The name derives from the Native American Squamscot, meaning red rocks. The local poet Alonzo Lewis wrote, Red glow the cliffs on Fisherman's Beach. The original Nom Kieg boundaries of Swampscott extended from Stacy Brook bordering Lynn to Beaver Brook on the Marblehead Line and inland to Essex Street. Essex Street and Humphrey Street were two important Native American trails that passed through the town. In 1604, when Samuel de Champlain sailed down the coast of Massachusetts and saw the North Shore, he remarked that the canoes of those who live there are made of a single piece and very liable to turn over if one is not skillful in managing them. Modern day kayaks are reminiscent of these early boats. The Indians thought the first ship was a walking island and the masts were trees, the sails white clouds. Champlain, a French explorer, also noted 
So many smokes and natives running to the surf to observe the ships all along the shore. There's a great deal of land cleared up and planted with Indian corn. The corn is very pleasant and agreeable. European visitors brought with them diseases that the Indians had no immunity to, wiping out as much as 90% of the Indians in Massachusetts. They lived in dense communities, which allowed the diseases to spread quickly. English explorer John Smith visited New England in 1614. When he returned eight years later, he noted, God has laid this country open for us. Where I had seen a hundred or two people, there are scarce ten to be found. Today, we have the medicine and science to mitigate some of the damages caused by plagues. In 1629, Poquanum, the sachem of Swampscott, also known as Black Will, had his camp located on Black Will's cliff. A chasm in the rocks was known as the cradle. A guest house called the Cliff House stood on Black Will's Cliff. They built steps from the house to the beach, which are still remaining today. Presently, St. John's parking lot and a small park with a shrine to Mary are located there. Longfellow said, till my soul is full of longing for the secret of the sea and the heart of the great ocean sends a thrilling pulse through me. In 1629, Francis Ingalls, one of the first European settlers, built a tannery on Humphreys Brook, located near the corner of Burrell Street and Paradise Road in Swampscott. John Humphrey, the first deputy governor of Massachusetts in 1629, lived in Swampscott. He contributed to the banishment of Anne Hutchinson. His home is believed to have stood in the Elmwood Street vicinity. There is a plaque where his house once stood. Charlie Baker, our current governor's home, is located close to where the Humphreys' house once stood. Swampscott's own Abednego Ramsdell fought the British and was killed in the Battle of Lexington and Concord on April 19, 1775, Patriot's Day. There is a marker for his service near the original location for his home. John Glover was a merchant seaman from Marblehead. In 1775, he formed the 14th Continental Regiment that fought in the Revolutionary War. George Washington commissioned Glover's vessel Hannah to plunder British ships as a privateer. It was the beginning of the Continental Navy. His regiment is famous for ferrying George Washington's army across the Delaware. In 1782, he retired to Glover Farm, which was originally owned by British loyalist William Brown, prior to the revolution and confiscated by the Massachusetts colonial government. It became the Sunbeam Inn from 1920 until 1955. Restaurateur Anthony Athanas established the General Glover House restaurant, which had an American colonial theme from 1957 until 1990. Today, the property is vacant. In 1857, Louisa May Alcott's sister Lizzie visited Swampscott for her health. Alcott writes of this visit in Little Woman, published in 1868. During the long hours when she lay on the warm rocks with her head on Joe's lap, while the winds blew healthfully over her and the sea made music at her feet. Her heroine Beth says, It's like the tide, when it turns it goes slowly, but it can't be stopped. In 1866, Mary Baker Eddy was living in Swampscott. After a fall on the ice, Mary Baker Eddy's recovery inspired the discovery of Christian science, spiritual healing for disease using prayer, not medicine. Health is not a condition of matter, but of mind. She was influenced by Phineas Quinby, a homopathic healer, and Eastern religions. In 1875, she wrote her book, Science and Health. She built a church in Lynn and a church in Boston and had a home in Chestnut Hill. According to Smithsonian Magazine, she is one of the most influential people. She wrote, to watch the moonbeam on the wave and catch an occasional glimpse in another survey of thought of one spiritual self to see what shadows we are and what shadows we pursue. In 1844, the industrialist Enoch Reddington Mudge had a 130-acre summer home, Elmwood, built in Swampscott. He lived in it until his death in 1881. 
In 1888, his land was subdivided into 191 lots. A large residential neighborhood was planned, designed by Frederick Law Olmsted. Design elements included curvilinear road layouts, traffic islands, and using topographical features in the layout of streets. And they also incorporated fine architecture in the buildings. It is bound by New Ocean Street, Paradise Road, Swampscott Ave, Reddington Street, and Morrill Street. Swampscott began as a fishing and farming village. The first Europeans saw fish jumping out of the water. Lobster was so plentiful you could walk into the water and pick them up. In 1808, the lobster trap was invented in Swampscott by Ebenezer Thorndike. And in 1814, Theopolis Brackett invented the Swampscott Dory, a flat bottom boat designed to be launched off the beach. Fishing remained an important industry until 1890. The current fish house was built in 1896 to replace the fish houses that were moved off of Blaney Beach. It guaranteed a forever fisherman's landing and a suitable fish house. It is the oldest active fish house in the country. Where the fishing shacks were cleared, a wall was erected, land filled, and a bandstand added to become Swampscott's first park. The English cannon captured in the War of 1812 marks the site of the original fish house. It was used as a fog warning and is now dedicated to Swampscott fishermen. An eagle stands for all the early bird pilots who dared to soar. In the Seaman's Memorial, an anchor believed to be from the Tedesco, a bark that sank off the coast, are located in this park, which is now dedicated to General John R. Chasen, Chief of Staff of the U.S. Marine Corps. Picturesque Fisherman's Beach has been a favorite image of Swampscott painters and photographers. The Lynn Beach Painters, a group of American marine impressionists at the turn of the century, used the beach for inspiration. Photographs of the beach were used for postcards, and now images are shared on social media networks. The beach is now mostly a recreational town beach where boaters, sunbathers, swimmers, walkers, and more enjoy the offerings year-round. The Swampscott Club, a men's social club overlooking Fisherman's Beach, is dedicated to boating. President Ulysses S. Grant is rumored to have visited there. They were known for sponsoring the Dory Regatta, and every 4th of July they opened their doors to the public. The Eastern Railroad steam train from Boston commenced in 1838. The current rail station at Swampscott was built in 1868. Across the street was Calvary's Grocery Store, which is now the Railroad Ave Professional Building. In 1872, the Swampscott Spur to Marble Head was added, with stops at Phillips Beach and Beach Bluff, which had a post office. Where the train crossed Humphrey was the Phillips Beach Fire Station. In 1890, Boston and Maine bought the rail line from Easton. The spur was operational until 1959. The railbed, a national grid utility corridor, is now in development to become a rail trail, a recreational space for town that will connect to the Marblehead Rail Trail. In 1874, a trolley was extended from Lynn, which was at first horse-drawn. In 1884, the cars were electrified. It ran along Humphrey Street to Beach Bluff and then on to Marblehead until 1937. Humphrey Street was dug up and widened in 1914. A pedestrian right-of-way was built in the early 1900s connecting Ingram Terrace to Rockland Street for trolley access. Three years after the Puritan settlement of Salem, John Endicott, first governor of Massachusetts, told some of the settlers to go where thou would and thus begin the first settlement of Swampscott. At the time, the native population was very small and seasonal. Swampscott started as a rural town. The first streets were Essex, Cherry, Humphrey, and Orient, which is now known as Puritan. Burrell Street was a cart path with trails connecting farms. William Witter built a home in 1629 opposite Black Will's Cliff. His claim of purchasing Swampscott from Black Will for two pestle stones was not recognized by the court. The Blaney House was built by Captain Ralph King in 1641. The Burrell House 
1700, King claimed George Washington stopped here. He may have passed through Swampscott after his visit to Salem in Marblehead on his return to Boston during his campaign in 1789. Down by the fish house was the town pound until 1829 for stray livestock. This medieval village enclosure of a stone or wooden pen was to hold stray livestock with a fine levied for owners to retrieve animals. Fishing shacks can still be spotted along Puritan Road. From around 1916 until 1954, Chasen's Boathouse made practical boats. In the 1800s, as America became industrialized, Swampscott became the first resort town. When the train was extended into Swampscott, there was a great increase in summer visitors. Many who summered here from 1870 to 1940 were on the social register. The Boston Herald described the coastal North Shore in 1894 as charming villas by the sea and handsome country residences where elegant leisure is enjoyed in their natural simplicity. Nature grown so coquettish as to exhale a compound extract of salt air in the aromatic odor of the pines. Woodside Farm, built in 1824, was purchased by General Charles Stetson, an associate of Enoch Reddington Mudge. His property abutted the Mudge estate, with Paradise Road being a dirt road that connected the properties. Daniel Webster was said to be a visitor. In 1848, Blisswood was built on Little's Point. James Little altered and enlarged it in 1884. Elmwood on Monument Ave was built in 1880 in the Georgian Revival style. The owner, Elihu Thompson, was founder of General Electric. The building has served as town hall since 1944. There was once an observatory on the grounds. Grasshead on Little's Point was built 1882. Arthur Little, an architect, designed it for his father, James Little, introducing the shingle style. White Court was built in 1896 on Little's Point in the neoclassical style by Frederick E. Smith, a manufacturer of railroad cars. President Calvin Coolidge summered here in 1925 from June 22nd until September 10th. In 1864, Charles Galoops, a lawyer, built Strodehurst, a 40-room mansion on Galoops Point. It was destroyed by a fire in 1876. Arches was built in 1904 at Phillips Beach for Andrew Preston, president of the United Fruit Company. The Stephen Wardwell home built in 1890 on Humphrey Street is now the rectory for St. John's Church. On Reddington Street, there is a Gothic revival home built in 1845. The Hope Cottage on Essex Street was a turn-of-the-century home for young unwed mothers who went away to have their babies, which were given up for adoption. The Florence Crittenton Mission was established by New York businessman Charles Crittenton, whose four-year-old daughter Florence had died from scarlet fever. In 1951, Sylvia Plath spent the summer at Beach Bluff as a babysitter for the Mayo family, caring for three small children. There are references to the area in her novel, The Bell Jar. In The Babysitter, she writes, The bold gulls dove over us as if they owned it all. We picked up sticks of driftwood and beat them off, then stepped down the steep beach shelf and into the water. Rockland Boulevard, inland Massachusetts, Swampscott. I'm just making this up. Some visitors to Swampscott preferred to stay in rented lodgings, which ran from boarding houses to opulent hotels. Tavern owner S.H. Wardwell built the Lincoln House in 1864 on Fishing Point. It was dismantled in 1915. The Wiley House, whose proprietor was James Wiley, began as a boarding house in 1910. Later, it became the Seabreeze Inn. It was destroyed by a fire in 1975. Big Anawan was a family hotel located near Tupelo Road. It was later called the Oakland House. The Ocean House was built in 1835 on Wales Beach. After two fires, 
1864 and 1881, it was reborn as the new Ocean House. In 1902, it was renovated, creating the largest wooden structure resort hotel in Massachusetts. It was a total loss after burning in a fire in 1969. Hotel Preston was established by Andrew Preston on Beach Bluff in 1872. It burned down in 1957. Captain Jack's, built in 1835, started out as a guest house, and from 1970 until 2011, it was a waterfront inn, the last public accommodations in Swampscott. It was torn down in 2012 to make room for condos. The town library was founded in 1852 with a gift from Dr. William R. Lawrence, a summer residence. It began as a subscription library. It became a free library in 1879 and was housed in a room in the town hall. The new library building was opened in 1917 on land donated by Elihu Thompson. There was an addition to the building in 1955 and again in 1996. Until 1953, the Sculpins were Swampscott's original team mascot. A Sculpin is a small fish, and Swampscott is a small fishing village. Stan Bondelevich coached Swampscott football from 1953 until 1976. He led Big Blue to eight unbeaten championship seasons. Dick Lynch was a three-sport coach for Swampscott High. He came to Swampscott in 1954. As an assistant manager in football, he contributed to Big Blue's 32-game winning streak. As a basketball coach, he led the team to a state championship in 1968 at the Boston Garden. One of his players, Fran Sheehan, went on to play bass for the rock band Boston. The baseball team won two Northeast Conference crowns and attended two state finals under his tenure. Mike Lynch was an all-star athlete at Swampscott High, coached by his father in football, baseball, and basketball. He played football and baseball at Harvard. All in the roll here. The whole season's right here on the foot of Mike Lynch. Right-footed kicker, snap from center, good. Ball down, kick up, it is good, it's good! Mike Lynch hits a 26-yard field goal. Mike Lynch, Harvard takes a 10-7 lead, and maybe the Ivy League title is going to rise. As a beloved local celebrity, Mike Lynch recently retired from a 37-year career in sportscasting earning 16 Sportscaster of the Year awards. Dick Jerron set Northeast Conference records as a big blue running back. He also played on the championship Swampscott basketball team. He went on to become an All-American at Yale and played for eight years for the NFL, following up with nine seasons as head coach for the Chicago Bears and Buffalo Bills. He was AP NFL Coach of the Year in 2001. In 1967, Swampscott football captain Bill Adams played both offense and defense line. He had a strong career at Holy Cross College as well as six years for the NFL, including the Buffalo Bills for 46 games. He became head coach for Linfield High School. Big Blue two-way lineman Tom Toner helped Dick Jerron set rushing and scoring records. He played for Idaho State and was captain. He played four seasons with the Green Bay Packers from 1973 until 1977. He then became a sports agent. His brother Ed Toner, a current Swampscott resident, played with the Patriots from 1967 until 1969. <laughs> Hometown hero Tony Canigliaro attended St. Mary's High School in Lynn. He started playing for the Boston Red Sox at age 19. The right-handed power hitter hit a home run, his first home game at bat. Johnny Pesky was one of his managers. He had a promising career until 1967 at age 22. 
and Aaron Pitch knocked him out and caused permanent eye damage. This was the year of the impossible dream, when the Red Sox won the pennant. He came back after a year but continued to be affected by poor eyesight and was unable to sustain his baseball career. Because fans' light-colored clothing distracted his eye from the ball, center field sections 34 and 35, Fenway's Canigliaro's corner, was blocked off with a tarp during day games. Billy Canigliaro played big blue baseball with Dick Lynch as his coach. The outfielder joined his older brother Tony on the Red Sox in 1969 and 1970. He continued his MLB baseball career until 1973. He won a World Series championship with the Oakland A's. Johnny Pesky, who was a longtime Swampscott resident, was an MLB ball player from 1942 until 1954 playing on the Red Sox eight of those years, missing two years to serve in World War II. In 1946, he was an all-star. From 1963 to 1964, he was manager for the Red Sox. In his later years, he served Boston as an honorary manager and coach. In the North Shore Spirit, a minor league that played at Fraser Field and Lynn, Pesky was welcomed as a guest coach. Pesky Pole, the foul pole at Fenway, is named for him. I grew up in Swampscott, Massachusetts. How about Swampscott? Swampscott has town pride. Throughout the year, activities and celebration bring the town together. On January 1st, the Swampscott Yacht Club's Polar Plunge at Swampscott Beach raises money for a different charity every year. On the 4th of July, the town has a strawberry festival, parade, concert, and fireworks. In late summer, there is a bonfire on the beach. Beer gardens popped up last summer, and the fall has a car show. The Thanksgiving football game is a good place for catching up with old friends and supporting the football team. The police association's holiday parade and family events at Town Hall bring old and young together to end the year. After a few high-profile police brutality cases, the world is waking up to the injustices that people of color face. Being home with COVID social distancing, we have begun to experience the wildlife around us. The world has gotten quieter and pollution has gone down. Our pets were also happy to have us around. People have been quarantined in their homes, unable to go out and celebrate in the usual way, yet they have found new ways to communicate, to celebrate, to work, to live. There. Thank you, Marie. Oh, you're welcome. That can you was, hear me? I can that hear was Marie amazing, now. Marie. Oh, thank you. I, you know, in hindsight, there's so much I would have done differently, but you know, you live and learn. I would have, it, like when you watch Rick Steves, I could have gone slower and paused, but for some reason I had to do everything at once. I thought it was amazing. Thank you. Great job. It was, I it was it very fascinating much. to do. Does anybody have any questions? I have lots of stuff to share. <laughs> if you'd like to type questions into the chat, or um, if you just let us know that you'd like to say something, we'd be happy to take questions. Um, somebody did ask if anyone knows the history or significance behind the SHB bricks. The what? There's um, bricks. I've seen some bricks with SHB imprinted on them in the sidewalks around the town, around the town, along the Aspen Road, Ocean View, Millet Road circle. 
Um, and they're asking if anyone knows the significance of what HSHB is. Mm. Nope, okay. Um, Marie, someone with like your sources posted somewhere. Okay. And was there a mention of how or when swamps got broke off from Lynn in the 1800s? Uh, no, it was like 1856 when uh, they kind of were so separate already that Lynn had no problem with saying, go on your own. And they were always considered a, a separate town. They were always swamp spot, even in 16, the 1600s. So there was swamp spot, Saugus, Wapata Lynn. So I think it just, they become became unwieldy. Danvers was part of Salem. So it, it broke off when it was kind of like they were sort of doing their own, um, a lot of their own governing. I think it just became official. But I think that's where the town seal says, you know, that it was established. Uh, the town was established legitimately in I think it's 1856, but that settled in three years after Salem. But Salem, Swampscott was settled before Boston, which was surprising to me. I want to say I thought the visuals were wonderful. You had some moving pictures. You had um, different, you know, some old, some new. Uh, so I thought I thought it was very, very well done. Thank you. When I could, I I tried to have the old sites and the new sites. Yeah, I noticed. Of course, I was kind of dismayed that a lot of Swamp's God has been um, obliterated. <laughs> You know, that, that did kind I, of many, many people agree with you there, although there are a great many that are still, you know, still uh, demolishing and getting rid of the old houses. But um, even the old I, the the old mansions, they just, you know, they're in a nice place. They just take them down and put up something new. Right. But um, the uh, Captain Jack's, you know, they just said, well, that doesn't matter. But what I really was interested was um, the, the General Glover, because they decreed that that wasn't anything that had historical significance. But I disagree because there's a lot of old buildings on that site and it looks like you can still see the farm there. I know it's probably been updated, but just to well, the Glover farm. That property is owned by three communities, Lynn, Marblehead, and Salem. And that's been a problem in trying, uh, obviously it's a blighted property now, but I think that's been a lot of the problem with, you know, trying to uh, ask the family to demolish it or, re, re, you know, to renovate it or whatever. I them to, you know, donate it to a historical thing and try to maintain it because there's not much open space. You could make it a park and you could update the houses. No, you could. It's out in Harvard, they've done a, a nice job with. I'm sure those buildings weren't in great condition, but. And, but I also think when you go to Salem, you see all this old buildings but Salem was a big city right away Swampscott was a fishing and farming village so probably the oldest homes were you know the fishing shacks and the smaller homes I don't think we had like the downtown like Salem has because you walk around there and there's buildings from every age I, do, I don't know good I, I don't know here where you can see old buildings, except for the fish houses. Well, I think that um, they they certainly have tried to save whatever they can, but you can't if it's if it's private property. Um, now uh, people mm -hmm. can 
can, people can do what they want with their own. And some are opting to sell it for as much money as they can get and they sell right. it to developers. Uh, yeah. Although the historical commission and the society try very hard to to save these. Uh, I don't think we have enough spirit in the town to, to gather enough force to save them. I mean, the work that was done to save uh, Marion Court was tremendous. Uh, the same with Captain Jacks. I mean, there were meetings and there were discussions and lawyers and everything else, but in the long run, they sold it to the developers, so. Right. right, but I, you know, they they decreed that these weren't historical properties and I, have a no, problem with didn't. that. No, they didn't. They said they definitely were. As uh -huh. far as uh, White Court, I mean, it was considered uh, definitely historically significant by the commission, and it was voted by the commission to be saved. And yet, right. and yet, when they sold it, they could sell it to developers. And it was the summer White House. Yes, I know. Oh, it was a shame, a shame. A oh, shame. it was sad. So we have to uh, try to rally and I guess you people have been working on this, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy that they're doing the rail trail that I feel really positive about. Mm -hmm. That seems like a positive development for the town. Mm -hmm. I'm not so happy about Stanley school becoming a huge monstrosity in the neighborhood and the traffic. I'm not sure how that's going to go, but. Well, it took 20 years to get the high school built, so don't lose any sleep over it just yet. <laughs> yeah. Good point. <laughs> it's true. It's it, they, The wheels of justice move very slowly in this town. The only thing that goes fast is when they knock things down. Right. <laughs> when they build them up. And also, thank you for that note about Sylvia Plath and um, oh, yeah. her poem, Suicide Off Egg Rock. Um, that was one I wasn't familiar with. So that was, um, we can add that. I have a list of, a very tiny minor list of poems about Swampscott. And it's good to know that that's- I added that one. to the, I used that in the Nahant video. Good, good. I did Egg Rock in the Nahant. Even though, you know, Swampscott, that's a big part of our landscape. And so I quoted what part of her poem in that. Because uh, she also went to Nahant. She also went to Lynn and wrote about Lynn. Mm. Um, are there any other comments or um, observances? Any, any other comments this evening? Thank you. It was All right. Very, it was very informational. Was Thank fine. you. Very interesting and very well done. Appreciate the effort. Thank you. Thank you for being patient with us while we tried a new thing of having this both over YouTube and over Zoom. Well, um, I have a question, Susan. Yes. Uh, um, well, during the, the presentation, <clears throat> four, on, on my screen anyway, four of us were are on there. Did that show on the TV? I'm not sure about the TV. I could see. I did try to look. It, no, my, I had the TV on and there wasn't any people on it. Oh, good. 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 Yeah. Okay. All right. I, I, I can't see there were three people watching on YouTube, but I couldn't I couldn't tell about the TV, but um, I did see that three are watching on YouTube. So we were really happy about that. Um, and you can always see it on the Swampscott YouTube channel at a later date if you wanted to watch it. And I will uh, I'll work on the list at the, at the back of it is a partial list of the sources, but there's many more. Yeah. If you watch, if you go to the Swampska Public Library, if you go to YouTube and type in Swampska Public Library, our channel will come up. And um, yeah, it, it, when, you're, when you're watching it, the screen was a little smaller and you could, everything fit just a little bit better. And at the very end, you can pause as you go through and look at the, um, the references. Um, you can pause and look at that. But if, Marie, if, if you do a list, I can put them on our website too. Yeah. Because there's, like I said, there's more. There's a lot of internet sources. The sources about the Native Americans was a Harvard source, to, you know, whatever. The, the Library of Congress. So there's some... I have listed, but there's 
there's more extensive sources. And there's also a lot of the books in the library I used and maps. So. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for joining us. It made it quite Thank a successful evening. All right. We appreciate it. Yay. All right. And if, you, if you're interested, there's also a Corona Cation. Mm -hmm. This is very similar. I love the title. Yeah. <laughs> Marie, this has nothing to do with Swampscott, but when I was a little girl, I lived next door to your Aunt Ruth and Uncle John. Oh. <laughs> I live oh, in the is... Eight Superior. Oh. And my parents. My Aunt Ruth is still there. Really? Yes, really. And she's still Crackerjack. You should uh, give her a call. Yeah, I did she's... to her. Yeah, she's very sharp. She's lost her eyesight. Yes, I know that. Yeah. But she's, she's perfectly um, coherent. And, and your she's... parents were great, too. Oh, thank you. Wow, you knew my grandparents. Uh, yeah, I did. <laughs> my dad was born on the I knew table. Your dad too. <laughs> he was born on a table in Swanscott on Beach Ave. Really? Goodness. The table. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's when they didn't go to hospitals. Right. That the place that the woman had their babies at, the young woman, yeah. a lot of the the women in the town started to want to go there to have their babies. Somebody I so, know was born there, and the, the parents were married by that at that point. But he said that he was born at the at the hospital. I think they yeah. called it the Swan Scott Hospital. Mary, do you remember? I don't know if Mary's still here, yeah. but I think they called it the Swan Scott Hospital. I don't know. Well, they said that women were like, "I want to go." I mean, can you imagine having the baby on the kitchen table? My father was born at home. I don't think it was unusual, I guess. No, I don't think so. But they said the women in the town started to want to go there. And they really pressured the young women to um, give the babies for adoption. You couldn't have the baby and then keep it. It was sort of like all a package deal. That was a different era. Yeah. For sure. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And we really appreciate Marie. This was lovely. I'm I'm glad you gave us a uh, an excuse to have try a new program format. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you. It was we'll great. Say good night to everyone. Good night. Right. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.